Good morning and good afternoon. Thank you for joining today's webinar. This event will cover Chain Reaction Research's recent report on Soju Guestbo, a soy trader tied to deforestation and other social issues. Chain Reaction Research is a consortium of aid environment, climate advisors, and Profundo. Together, we conduct sustainability risk analysis. Our special focus is demonstrating that deforestation is material financial risk. We focus on tropical deforestation related commodities, including palm oil, soy, kettle, coffee, cacao, timber pulp and paper, and other products. Before we begin today's presentation, I'll introduce the speakers and go over some ground rules for the presentation. Today's event will begin with Sarah Drost of Aid Environment, who will provide an overview of Soju Guestvo and links to deforestation. Next, our guest speaker, Andre Campos of Reporter Brazil, will share a specific case study of soy related deforestation. And finally, Gerard Reich of Profundo will cover the potential financial risks related to Soju Guestvo. And going over some ground rules and how the presentation will go today. All attendee lines will be muted. Uh, please use the Q&A function to ask questions throughout the presentation, and we will try to answer as many of them as possible at the end of the session. And a recording of the webinar today will be sent to all registrants. And with that, move on and begin the presentation with Sarah. Thank you, Kyle. So hi, everyone. So you may wonder why do we publish a report on a rather unfamiliar company, uh, Södra Gesfo? Because if you look at the right, which is a table on the left of major Brazilian soy exporting groups in 2022, you can see that Södra Gesfo is actually ranking number 16. So it's not, uh, it's a relatively small scale uh, exporter if you compare to companies such as Cargill, ADM, Bungay or Kofco. But however, at the same time, we found that the company expanded its sourcing, processing and trading capacity of Brazilian soy in the last years. And also we were pretty intrigued by the fact that although the company was incorporated in Luxembourg in 1994, the company actually operates under Russian ownership. So actually the owners are uh, a Russian uh, armor officer and his wife, uh, and both are listed as billionaires by Forbes. Um, and we also saw that they are both sanctioned by, uh, by Ukraine. Uh, and I come back to that later. Um, so apart from being a soy and rapeseed trader uh, and processor, it's also a company that is heavily involved in, uh, in logistics uh, and in infrastructure. So Södra Gesvo owns also its own seed terminals and rail cars. Uh, and we also found that in trade data analysis that the company is actually supplying soy to Europe which makes it subject to uh, European anti-deforestation legislation. Uh, and I will also discuss that in the next slides. Uh, we are also already aware of, uh, of a known case that is researched really well by uh, Reporter Brazil, among others, that linked the company to illegal deforestation. Uh, so that case will be uh, handled by Andre Campos after my presentation. And also we found significant European funding linked to the company, uh, which we also found may prove tricky in the current sensitivities linked to Russian invasions in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and Gerard will also discuss this later in his presentation. Next slide, please. So we know that the company's uh, major destination countries are Russia, China, and Turkey. Uh, but in the middle column in the table on the right, you can see that we also found that the company supplies soy to Spain and Poland and the Netherlands. Uh, and also from Paraguay, uh, we know it's supplying soy to Luxembourg, uh, but that's not in this table because this is focusing on Brazil. We found that uh, among its major clients are, apart from a lot of Chinese and Russian and Turkish uh, companies, also the key uh, soy traders, Kofco, Bungay, Cargill, ADM. Uh, and as I also explained, because we know the company is also supplying to Europe, 
it will be subject to uh, some legislations in Europe, uh, of which we believe most relevant are the European deforestation regulation that was adopted last year. Uh, and that requires that soy operators uh, that are the companies that first place soy products on the European market, they can no longer be uh, linked to deforestation or forest degradation after the cutoff date of uh, 31st of December 2020. Uh, and we found also in our trade data analysis that, for instance, Bange and ADM uh, are still sourcing from Sodru Gastro after this cutoff date. Then there's also a proposed uh, Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, the CSDDD, uh, which basically uh, requires that commodity companies need to set up uh, due diligence processes uh, to identify risks, environmental and human rights risks in their supply chains. And they should also take appropriate action and mitigate those risks. Uh, and yeah, as also you have already heard that there are some ties to Russia, we believe that there's reason that Södru Gestvo might be potentially uh, controversial in any due diligence process. Um, so as I said, the owner is a Russian former army officer. We also read that uh, allegedly, allegedly he mainly appointed Russian former army officers as executives of the company in his hiring strategy. Both owners are sanctioned by Ukraine because it is said that they are uh, generating finance uh, or generating financial resources for the Russian government. Uh, there are also uh, accusations of close business ties between Södru Gestvo and the Russian government. So we believe that this company may fall under closer scrutiny in the due diligence processes of companies and for EU legislations. Next slide, please. Um, so its main operations in Brazil are uh, under its subsidiary Alianza Agricola do Cerrado, uh, and we found that it supplies soybeans from both Amazon and Cerrado biomes in Brazil. Uh, in, in Brazil, the company operates two crushing plants um, in Mato Grosso do Sul and in Sao Paulo, as you can see in the map in the right with the blue icons. And the company reportedly has a warehouse capacity of over 275,000 metric tons. Apart from that, it also has partnerships with many other uh, warehouses in Brazil. And from trace data, we identified that the company mainly sources from three Brazilian states, Minas Gerais, Mato Grosso and Pará. And especially for Mato Grosso and Pará, we know that they are most exposed to deforestation risk. Um, and we also know particularly Cerrado vegetation is currently insufficiently protected under both Brazilian and European laws. So in Brazil, we know that depending on the location, uh, still 65 to 80% of the Cerrado vegetation can be cleared on a farm if you have the right environmental licenses. Uh, and also under the EU deforestation regulation, the wooded land is currently excluded from its scope. Uh, and we know that Aid Environment has calculated that about 70% of the Cerrado will not be protected under the European deforestation regulation at the moment. Um, and this despite its very high carbon storage capacity. So also for Alianza Agricola, clients include some of the well-known soy commodity traders, ADM, Bungay, Cargill, and Kofco. Next slide, please. So Alianza is one of the signatories of the soy moratorium. Uh, so it has committed to not buy any soy from properties where Amazon rainforest has been cleared after July 2008. However, there is evidence that uh, that the company still bought soy from farms that have, uh, yeah, that were in breach of this soy moratorium. And that one of the most well-known cases is the Formoso farm complex. Uh, and Andre will, that will discuss this case in the next presentation. But for this study, we also looked into a sample of 73 soy farms that supply uh, Alianza de Agricola. 
uh, and we found that uh, 830 hectares of deforestation occurred in the sample between 2018 and 22, especially in nine of the, of the 73 farms. Um, and we also saw that this is all in Mato Grosso, uh, and we know that they all supply soy, these farms, to, uh, to Alianza do Agricola. Uh, and almost half of this deforestation is very much likely being illegal because it occurred in either legal reserves or in permanent preservation areas, also called APP. So a particular risk case is the Sitio Santa Fe, which is with the red circle. And you can see in the next slide uh, image of that. Next slide, please. Um, because this farm actually uh, was showing uh, illegal clearing, so the clearing took place in a legal reserve, uh, even in November 2022, uh, which is after the cutoff date of the EU deforestation regulation. So there was uh, illegal clearing by fire in November 2022. This is in the municipality Marcelandia in the Mato Grosso state in Brazil. So we also know that this farm supplied at least 120 metric tons of soybeans to Alianza Agricola de Cerrado. Uh, and we also know that, yeah, as I said, Bangue and, and ADM are still uh, sourcing from, from this Brazilian subsidiary of Sodro Gesfo. So this might really involve a non-compliant case for both Bangue and ADM, which they should definitely do some research on. Um, and that's also my main conclusion is that uh, we see that buyers from Soto Gastro Group, such as ADM, Bangay, Cargo, and Kofco, they face reputational risk, but also legal risk from the EU deforestation regulation from deforestation in the properties linked to, uh, to Soto Gastro, and also because of the ties with Russia. And Gerard will also discuss financial risks in his presentation. But first, uh, let's turn to André Campos of Reporter Brazil, who's going to talk about the illegal Amazon clearing linked to the company. Thanks a lot, Sarah. So my idea here, I'm going to present a, a case study that we have investigated together with other uh, journalist groups, uh, the, the Guardian, Unerted, and the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. It's about a, a, a supplier, a farmer, uh, involved in multiple violations in the Amazon region, in the, who, is, uh, who we identified as a supplier of uh, the company here in Brazil, not only the Agrianza Agricola do Cerrado subsidiary from Southern so the Jesco, but also other companies. And uh, our investigation uh, started during the 2020 firing season, you know, September, October, this is a period in Brazil where usually uh, illegal deforestation through illegal fires occurs. And we noticed this very huge, huge area in the Northern Mato Grosso uh, being burned thousands of hectares. And uh, we started to take a look on this area to see what we could, could learn about the property, the ownership and the supply chain. And we discovered some interesting things about it. Uh, next, next slide, please. So what was the story? Basically, uh, we find out, found out that this fire was uh, just another uh, crime uh, taking place in, a, in an area that was subjected uh, in the years before to illegal deforestation, uh, who was identified by the Brazilian state, was subjected to fines, to embargoes. And uh, we also identified that despite of this, uh, this area was uh, receiving soy plantation, was soy was being planted there in an area that was uh, interdicted by the government that therefore uh, shouldn't uh, be uh, receiving any kind of agriculture activity. Uh, lawsuits against the farmer owning this place uh, going on in this time, uh, 2019, 2020. And nevertheless, what we saw is that uh, 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 Southern Jesu Brazil 
was being supplied by this particular farmer, you know, that uh, had, you know, in debt uh, with the Brazilian authorities, millions and millions in fines and and all uh, all the production in this area was very problematic. Um, as I told you, you know, we have satellite uh, analysis that was established that soya was being grown, you know, in areas that were illegally deforested in this cluster, you know, this productive, this, pro this soy production cluster. Uh, and uh, this, just as Sarah explained, is something that violates the soya moratorium, the Amazon moratorium for soya that has you know the Russian group as one of its signatories. Basically, the signatories they 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 commit not to buy you know soya that was planted in areas deforested after two thousand eight. That was the case in this particular farm cluster. Uh, but you know what happens and uh, is that uh, you have in the Amazon region nowadays, uh, uh, a big, big uh, traceability loophole, that's the loophole that we are mentioned here in the title of the story, that uh, allows, you know, uh, soy being uh, planted in illegal areas in violation to the moratory to be sold with some paperwork that uh, gives uh, uh, um, uh, the false impression of uh, legality, you know, in this type of trade. That's what we call uh, soil laundering. So this was a very specific case of soil laundering risk. And uh, I will explain how this works in practical terms here in Brazil. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, that's that's the farm that we're talking about here. It's it's called the Formosa farm. Uh, here you see the map of this uh, big area with some uh, internal boundaries uh, in, 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 in a huge piece of land. You know, this, is our, this here is thousands and thousands of hectares. And, uh, you know, this all belongs to this, to this farmer that was supplying uh, uh, Alianza Agricola do Cerrado here in Brazil. Uh, but, uh, you know, and it's, it's, a, it's an area with some, some artificial internal boundaries, but uh, what happens is that is, 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 is managed, you know, as a single entity. So common sense for us, you know, is that this is one single farm, of course. And therefore, if there is illegal deforestation in this place, uh in violation with the soy moratorium this farm shouldn't be able to sell you know products to companies like uh sodru guest food that are signatories and what people usually do here in the amazon this is a very common thing basically they declare the area as not one single farm but as uh, multiple farms that have borders uh, uh, borders with each other you know so on paper what's in practical terms one farm becomes multiple farms and this multiple farms includes uh, lots where you have illegal deforestation lots where you don't have illegal deforestation and lots that are compliant with the moratory regulations lots that are not compliant with the moratory regulations when you do that, you know, and you have papers uh, that allow you to do this kind of paperwork, you basically uh, uh, are in a situation where you can sell your products, declaring that the soy was planted in one of these internal boundaries that's compliant with the regulations. Although you don't have any kind of uh, assurance that this is actually what's going on, you know, because basically it's self-declaration. The farmers are saying, you know, uh, that the product comes from a particular area. Although there is no traceability mechanisms that can uh, that are able to really verify this, so it might be coming from uh, the place that was illegally deforested. 
uh, and therefore being sold through uh, so uh, soil laundering screens. That's what, what we call soil, soil laundering. And the companies that are buying have no tools to identify this kind of uh, practice nowadays. So, and this is something that's important to say, it's not specific to the uh, Sodrigest uh, supply chain, but affects all the major traders apply uh, doing business today in Brazil and has uh, huge consequences uh, as I'm going to discuss in my next slide. Uh, sorry, please, the, the next one. So look, uh, this is, this is, I just posted here is as a tweet from the, uh, the association that, uh, that, that represents the main soy traders here in Brazil, including Sergio Gesfu, but also Cargill, Bongi, et cetera. And they are talking about the implementation of the new EU uh, anti-deforestation regulation, you know. As, as you probably know, we have a new law in the EU saying that they will they want to sack products that come from areas that were uh, recently deforested, including soy. And you know, uh, we spend a lot of time discussing uh, if this should be applied to uh, a larger portion of Brazil, parts of the Cerrado uh, that are not covered. And we should, of course, discuss this. But I think that we don't pay that much attention to the fact that uh, <clears throat> uh, the other big Thing that should be discussing much more is how you know this is going to be uh, become a, a credible legislation since we have this kind of traceability issues that we have just discussed. Uh, that really is a widespread question here in Brazil. Uh, basically, the, the law says that you have to traders, you know, companies have to present evidence that. Uh, through geo coordinates of farms and uh, trading documents saying that what they are buying not comes from areas that were deforested after a certain date. But I assume at this point that this regulation is going to rely on the same, you know, um, types of due diligence that are going on right now for the soy moratorium, which is having these papers that are basically self-declaration by farmers about what where they are planting the product that is being sold and therefore uh, it's it's something that really is not going to tell the real truth in many of the cases and uh i'm just uh, uh pointing here that one of the points that the brazilian association is making that we cannot, uh, the new law needs to uh, focus on, uh, on areas of production and not in, uh, in, in you know, blocking farmers as, as a whole, you know, the, the person that's planting, but blocking particular areas, which is a fair argument because I think that if you are going to block a person instead of an area, in many cases, you are doing harm, you know, committing injustice things because that he, he might have issues, uh, in, in productive issues in, in a certain area, although he's planting legally in others. But at the same time, when you, you set this kind of standards and you don't provide, you know, a traceability systems that's capable of really tracking down what a person is selling to you uh, and linking this to a specific area, uh, uh, and you are basically uh, relying on self-declaration uh, of this farmer that in many cases are farmers that are linked to illegal activities, then you have a big issue because uh, you are not going to be able to deliver uh, uh, <clears throat> information that proves that you are complying with uh, moratory. And now the new, the same applies to the new legislation in the, uh, the EU legislation of imported deforestation. So that's it. I think this is a case that uh, is exemplary of how these things affect uh, supply chains here in Brazil from uh, the Sodru Gesso group, but also from other uh, companies involved in this trade here of soy. That's it for my presentation. So I'll pass to the, not to the next speaker. Yes, thank you very much. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, on financial risks for finances, there are two elements to focus on in our view. The first one is the EU deforestation regulation. If this is expanded to finances, and that might, there is a 2024 check on this, whether that is needed. And the second one is about potential links to financing the Kremlin, which forms a major reputation risk. Um, in the financing of Sodru Gestvo, we have focused on three financial flows here. Uh, for the first one is directly to, to the company. Um, the second one is the financing of its customers, parties that buy the small volumes from uh, Sodru Gestvo. And the third one um, are the finances of the co-owners of the Carol Sodru joint venture in Brazil, the minority shareholders. Um, for the first one, uh, the direct lending to Sodru Gestvo, the forest and finance uh, database give, uh, gave access to the information that the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development was engaged in a loan of uh, 130 million US dollars to Sodru Gestvo. Of this, 45 million US dollars was provided by a syndicate of commercial banks. Um, and note that uh, the uh, European uh, Bank for Reconstruction and Development is owned by 71 countries and the European Union and the European Investment Bank. So this is quite a delicate issue. Um, next slide, please. Um, oh, sorry, uh, can you go back to the slide before? Yes, that one, yeah. Uh, the 2021 and annual accounts of Sodru Festival showed that some large banks are involved in financing the company. That's ING. You can see more than 90 million US dollars. Unicredit, uh, Societe Generale, 71 million. Uh, ABN Emro, uh, Credit Suisse, uh, and Credit Agricole for 44 million. So now we can turn to the next slide. Yes, thanks. Um, the second group of financial flows, which uh, which faces risk, is the one uh, or are the ones linked to the large soy traders that source from Sodru Kestvo. That is, and or Sarah already mentioned them: Cargill, Bunchy, ADM, and Kofco. Finances of these companies, you can find a large group of them on forest in the forest and finance uh, database face a variety of risks, including reputation risk as well as market access risk. However, this market concerning this market access risk, as volumes are relatively low, these large traders can easily switch to other soy suppliers than uh, Sodru uh, Gestvo uh, and consequently reduce their risk uh, here. Every financer, every financer would would every, probably every financer would recommend the four short traders to do this. Um, the third group of financial flows that faces risk is the one are the ones related to financing of the co-owners of the Carol Sodru uh, joint venture. Profits of this joint venture could support the finances of the of the Kremlin. The minority co-owners of the joint venture, Carol, is a cooperative and therefore in the hands of farmers. These farmers are partially financed by the Brazilian National Rural Credit System. Uh, several large European Union and USA banks are lending money to these farmers through this system. Um, next slide, please. Uh, when adjusted to soy financing only, uh, you can see that Santander, Rabobank, John Deere Bank and CNH Industrial Capital that is based in the Netherlands uh, do lend large amounts to this CNCR system, to, to this Brazilian uh, rural financing system. Uh, the good news is that we have names of the banks. Uh, the question is whether these banks can be pressed to check whether their 
financing is linked to farmers which are linked to Sodre Crespo joint venture. Banks will probably say that this is a lot of work and nearly impossible to, to do so. So that is the bad news. And with this bad news, I turn back to Kai. Thanks, Herd. And for now, we will take questions from the audience. So again, reminder, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function in the chat to uh, share some additional questions. So maybe we'll start with this one uh, for Andre. Under the EU deforestation regulation, companies need to submit polygon coordinates of the farms. So this will not over will this not overcome the challenge with the car declarations or are there still challenges there? Yeah, yeah, I'm afraid this is not uh, this is not something that is going to overcome the challenge. Uh, basically because uh, you might submit a polygon and this information is going to be based in the same uh, problematic original source uh, that we are dealing right now in Brazil, which is uh, a paper delivered by a farmer saying that he's selling for you something that was planted in a very specific area, and this might not be the true, uh, pretty much because uh, what people are doing nowadays in Brazil is that they are dividing their farms in a way in, in declarations, telling that a huge farm is made of uh, a number of uh, smaller bordering farms where you have some of these farms uh, with illegal deforestation, with re recent deforestation, and others that don't doesn't have this problem. So basically, they are going to keep selling uh, the product, uh, telling that the dirty, telling that uh, the, the the it's all coming from the clean area, but you don't have any traceability that assures this is actually going on, and the dirt. Dirty soil, let's say, put it that way, that, that way, can be mixed with this clean soil. And since you don't have traceability to the point of the grain itself, you know, uh, basically you don't have mechanisms to assure that this is actually a, a, a true scenario, what you're buying for. So I think we are going to spend some years discussing how, you know, these coordinates that being are being, uh, you know, presented as the farm of origin of plantations are really representing the truth of what's going on on the ground. Great, thank you. And for Herard, uh, how large are the financial risks and value for the banks involved? Uh, thank you. Um, the amounts that these companies are uh, lending uh, directly and indirectly, they are well compared to their own uh, to their uh, own total loan portfolio, relatively small. Although ING more than eight than ninety million commitment, that is quite a, that seems to be quite a large amount. But these loan portfolios are much large larger. So if these companies would lose this ninety million then let's say the direct impact on the profitability and on the value of the shares would be small. However, much larger, of course, is the reputation impact for these finances. A uh, company like, or a financer like ING is already linked to Russia because of its Russian activity. And we remember this bank of one year ago when they uh, when when it became clear that one that they are one of the banks which uh, lent a lot uh, into clients in in Russia. So when this one again uh, is on top of that, of course that reputation uh, and reputation of banks is already a very delicate issue. Um, is not really uh, uh, supported. So um, I would recommend. Uh, 
when I could recommend the bank uh, to take action, I would really uh, reduce my exposure and I would recommend NGOs to take some action against some campaigning against uh, these banks. Great. And for you, Sarah, can you provide again just an overview of what is covered in the EU deforestation regulation and when we might expect that to come into effect? Uh, yeah, so this regulation was uh, finally adopted or there was reached a political agreement in December 2022. Uh, and from that date, there will be a transition period of 18 to 24 months in which companies should make sure their systems are complying with the EU deforestation regulation. So I think, yeah, in 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 practice, we can expect uh, implementation from 2024, um, or even, yeah, so early 2024 will be uh, realistically, and then companies should also retroactively make sure that they're not connected to deforestation that occurred after December 2020. Um, so, yeah, as we showed already also in this uh, webinar, there are already deforestation events that are happening at this very moment and that will be non-compliant with this uh, EU deforestation regulation, even though it has not been implemented yet. Great. And then for Harard, uh, how large would be the market asset access risk for Bungi? Bungie and other companies um, that are currently being supplied by Sotru Gespo. Um, thank you for the, for the question. It, that's an uh, uh, it, it's 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 a very good question because these uh, companies like Bunchi Cargill, they have their clients. They have the clients in uh, that's a big variety of clients. And these clients can also have their uh, sustainability policies and also their policies about uh, uh, about uh, about uh, about Russia, uh, also about deforestation, of course. So, um, yeah, we know that these companies already have a long history of uh, of, of being linked to to deforestation, and we have seen up to now not dramatically large uh, impacts on Bunchy or Cargill that clients uh, uh, are walking away because the choice in moving away to another trader is not always very, 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 very substantial. So, uh, but nevertheless, it, also here, especially for Bunchy, uh, which is uh, which is a publicly listed company, there might be a reputation risk in the share price uh, for Cargill, which is not, which is a private company, of course, but uh, the bonds are listed. Uh, also here, there is a reputation risk when companies have, when investors have these bonds in their portfolio, there might be a reputation risk. So, um, uh, but the market access risk might be uh, relatively uh, limited. And as I already said, these companies can, because of the amounts, which are relatively small, uh, they would be wise to switch uh, uh, quickly to another uh, to another supplier. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, this one is for Sarah. Can certifications like Proterra or the RSPO be trusted? Um, yeah. Thank you for that question. So. I think it's first good to mention that under the EU deforestation regulation, uh, companies uh, cannot can no longer rely on uh, on any certification system. They might, of course, mention it in their due diligence, but it's not uh, yeah it's not offering uh, a free access or or green lane. Um, so yeah, you can no longer rely on certifications under the EU deforestation regulation. Uh, for RSPO, I can say that I did some research on on other companies like Sockfin, for instance, and yeah, there's yeah, there's really some controversy there that that yeah, some of these plantations of Sockfin in Africa, for instance, should never have been receiving RSPO certification. 
uh, because of all the, the, the disputes around land and land grabbing. So yeah, although RSPO is of course one of the main uh, systems for, for palm oil, um, yeah, in soy it's the RTRS and that I think that in Brazil only 1% is certified under RTRS, so that's so limited. So I think that will not make any sense. For Proterra, I, I don't really know. Maybe Andre, do you have an insight on this? Well, um, I can share some uh, thoughts and based on uh, research that we have done uh, uh, some time ago about specifically about a Proterra uh, certified farm in the Cerrado region here in Brazil. Uh, it's an interesting case that shows how, you know, uh, regulations of uh, the certified the certifications regulations sometimes can be like banded, you know, uh, and really not contribute to deforestation free products. We had this farm, you know, here in Brazil, which was a Proterra certified farm. Therefore, it shouldn't be, you, uh, you know, deforest uh, according to the new the, the Proterra standards. Uh, what they have done is that they, uh, very similar to the situations that we are discussing here in the Formosa case, the farm, uh, they have divided the area, you know, creating like two farms from this one, you know, and in one of these areas, they kept the certification and didn't uh, the farm wasn't, you know, uh, subject to the, any new deforestation, this new diminished farmer. But this other one uh, uh, was removed for, from the certification and then it was deforested. Uh, and uh, so, and then the soy was able, you know, to be sold to other markets that were not uh, receiving the, the certification. Two things to discuss in this kind of situation, I believe. It shows how, you know, uh, this product-based uh, standards and legislations have some limitations because the market can simply adapt, you know, and, uh, you know, there's always somebody willing to buy, you know, uh, things that are, are not, uh, 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 operating according to the forestation free standard and the market can simply you know in these companies the trading companies involved can simply adjust in a way that they can like make segregation and direct something that's supporting uh, that is going to a market that demands the forestation free products from specific areas and others are going to receive uh, you know standard products per se. So at the end of the day, when you're doing like this and considering that Europe places like this uh, are just a part of, you know, the, the, the final destination of Brazilian products, you don't really are generating the effect that you, you, you would like to generate with this kind of legislation, which is diminish deforestation. The other point to be made here, and I don't have any, you know, information to 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 affirm that a uh, case like this, where you have a div, a proteja divided farm, you know the, the 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 soy or the products that are being you know planted in the now neighboring farm that falls over the scope of the certification are being sold as proteja, but we should wonder how you know are the mechanisms that are comp uh, uh, a certification like this are, are 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 adopting to make sure you know this is not a risk you know they are following the harvesting on site uh, to see if what's being planted in the the area neighboring area that uh, is not certified anymore is not being directed to the same warehouse and mixed up with products that are being sold as you know deforestation free they are just like looking it or they are relying on, you know, documentation presented by the, the farmer saying the, the origin of the product. These are questions that need to be asked. 
you know, and, and really, the, the, I think the important message here, this applies, you know, for um, multiple situations, including certified uh, products, you know, um, trading schemes, is that you are only relying on the narrative of the paper of per paperwork presented by the farmers about the place of origin of products, or are you try to check this alternatively through some other ways, you know, that you can know better, you know? I think that's a, an important point to be made. Great, thanks both. Uh, Gerard, this one probably is for you. Uh, the in EU institutions lending money to Sodru Gespo um, seems abnormal um, according to this question. Uh, maybe you wanna dive a little bit further into that and why there might be some issues around uh, the ties between these EU institutions and Sodru Gespo. Yeah. Um... Well, of course, we have we have seen that there are uh, quite some links uh, between uh, the EBRD, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, uh, which is uh, co-owned by uh, by the European Union and by the European Investment Bank. This is not uh, this this is the case here for Sodru Kestvo. Um, I'm also now looking into another um, uh, study where also the, the, this, these European institutions um, have lent money to, uh, to, 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 to a sustainable, unsustainable uh, activities. So yeah, this is really something where, um, um, where, where, where campaigners can take a look at and can contact people from the European uh, Parliament to take some action um, as this is uh, well quite uh, quick gains you can have in ending the financing of uh, of companies like uh, like this thanks great we have uh, one more currently in the q and a function and i think this might be more for sarah and andre um, questions asking you know what uh, uses satellite monitoring in managing these types of risks is uh, satellite monitoring kind of accepted by the EU regulation as a way to verify that uh, commodities are not tied to deforestation and should companies be using satellite data to trace deforestation and monitor their supply chains. Yeah, I can start answering and then maybe Andre has some uh, additions. So yeah, definitely companies should use satellite data to trace deforestation, but it's not enough. So under how it's going to work under this EU deforestation regulation is that companies need to, so operators, so that are the companies that first place soy or beef or leather or palm oil in the European Union, they should uh, fill a declaration form basically saying that they declare that from all their suppliers, they are sure there has been no deforestation since the cutoff date. Um, and this for each of the farms by whom they are supplied, they need to uh, to provide coordinates of the farm or the polygons. Uh, if they are more than four hectares, um, which basically requires also for every commodity company that they have a very clear understanding who are their suppliers. So not only their direct suppliers, but also their indirect suppliers. And especially the latter is quite yeah, challenging for some commodities, including for soy and also for beef. Um, and of course, after they have identified these properties where they by whom they are supplied they should also do deforestation monitoring through satellite uh, imagery uh, yeah that's definitely a yes that they should do it like this but apart from satellite monitoring I believe they should also do more yeah groundwork knowing whether there's any land disputes linked to the case whether there's any other pollution linked to the case or it, it's not only deforestation that especially also under this uh, corporate sustainability due diligence directive that is upcoming. Satellite imagery is not enough. 
um, but it is at least a good start. So Andre, do you have any additions to that? Yeah, uh, just complimenting Sarah. Well, um, nowadays, you know, uh, true is that most of these companies that are going to be affected by the new EU regulation, you know, that are selling soy from Brazil to Europe, uh, they are already committed committed somehow with the principles of the legislation through things like the soy moratorium, which is basically a, a similar, you know, a standard. They are committed not to uh, for for the Amazon uh, at least, you know, not to 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 buy soy from areas that were the forest legally or illegally in the Amazon after two thousand eight, and uh, how they monitor these things uh, right now, you know, those days, they use they do use satellite monitoring systems, uh, so uh, it's a you know a standard approach for. For all of them, you have consulting companies providing, you know, uh, tools for you to do this, you know, a whole business set up around this kind of principles here in Brazil. And what they do basically is they take uh, the information that was provided by the farmer. And again, that's the, the big loophole about uh, the, uh, the farm of origin of the product. And they, they match this information with the satellite monitoring imagery system to see if this area that was declared by the, the farmer again uh, is eligible to do business according to the known deforestation standards they adopt. So again, uh, it doesn't solve the issue because the, the problem is not in this, the monitoring, the satellite monitoring uh, per se, but uh, the problem is that they are relying in documents provided by farmers about the place of origin of the products. So right now, the problem is that uh, companies, you know, and, and the legislation, the EU legislation probably is going to follow in the same problem, uh, at least in the, the first years. Uh, you, they, they are basically uh, relying in, 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 in a system of documents that provides you a narrative of compliance, but nobody's really looking uh, deeply if the documents are telling the truth of what is going on on the ground. And we have uh, a very, very, you know, multiple examples showing that the soil laundering risk uh, is something that is not here and there, you know, it's kind of a common practice alloyed by the fragilities of the documents, the car, the invoices, and the self-declaratory -declara aspect that's inherent to them, and, and the risks that disposes to the whole system of uh, monitoring through satellites. But if I may add one final uh, message on this is that under the soy moratorium, which is basically voluntary, there's not really like a system for legal proceedings, but be aware that under the EU deforestation regulation, those cases that uh, NGOs or campaigners or journalists can find that are non-compliant could indeed lead also now to legal proceedings under the EU deforestation regulation. So I think that's the, the major difference that even though, yeah, based on car or, or other uh, registry systems, people declare maybe other things, but if other organizations can prove this is uh, information that is not correct, they can also start legal proceedings under the EU deforestation regulation.